Welcome aboard the Shipshape Podcast, your ultimate destination for marine wisdom and expertise. Our skilled crew, comprised of top boating journalists and experts, is committed to delivering informative and captivating content week after week. We're eager to connect with and learn from our fellow mariners, and we encourage you to share our podcast with your friends. Remember, word of mouth is our lifeblood, and if you enjoy an episode, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. By doing so, you're helping us forge a robust community of mariners who can learn, collaborate, and exchange their experiences out on the water. Today on the Shipshape Podcast, we're venturing beneath the waves with E. Lee Spence, a renowned underwater archaeologist and treasure hunter. From his groundbreaking discoveries to his countless expeditions unearthing maritime secrets, Lee's career has been nothing short of legendary. Join us as we explore the world of submerged history, the ethics of treasure hunting, and the passion that drives those who seek to uncover the past. Grab your diving gear and let's take the plunge with Lee. Welcome to the Shipshape Podcast. My name is Farah Kareem. And I have been uh, part of the media industry for the last 20 or so years, working in radio and podcasts. And joining me is Meryl Charette. Meryl Charette. I'm a liveaboard on a Tashing, Toshiba the 36 in Boston, Massachusetts. So, Lee, where are you coming to us from? I'm actually in the middle of South Carolina right now. And the weather's been good here. We have sunny weather. It was 91 degrees today. That's all good. Sounds lovely, Lee. So as we begin this, I guess the first question is, what is the definition of treasure? Well, to me, it can be an old bottle. It can be a clay smoking pipe. To most people, it's gold or silver, but it's a history I love, and that's the real treasure. So like that saying goes, one man's trash is another man's treasure? Exactly. (laughs) So tell us, Lee, how did you get involved in this? When did you first suddenly discover that this was your interest and this is the career path you wanted to go down? I was four or five years old when I first started looking for stuff underwater. Back then, I was just wading in the water and my father had shown me that if I cut my hands above my eyes, put my face down in the water, it would allow a bubble to form and I'd be able to see underwater. And that was the start of my looking for stuff. First, it was just seashells. But my father told me about pirates and treasure, and it got me started. And then when I was 12 years old, I built my own dive gear and started actually looking for real wrecks and started finding them. I found five of them the year I was 12, and I've found them every year since then. I'm now, I'll be 76 in November. Wait, that's amazing. You built your own diving gear? Yes, It wasn't very good, but it worked. That's amazing. When I say it wasn't very good, I could have killed myself very easily with it. I was very (laughs) lucky to have survived what I built. Oh, wow. Well, it sounds that your family was somewhat involved in this. And as you kind of pursued this direction, how did your family handle it? Well, my father was a military intelligence, so he was somebody that uh, didn't really know danger. Uh, And I say he didn't know it. He didn't feel danger. He sure knew it. He'd sure been exposed to it and lived through it. So he thought it was great what I was doing. I couldn't even talk to it it about my mother because she would stop me every time she could. Anyway, I kept at it. My father didn't own a boat. What he did in the water was limited to occasionally fishing from shore to show us kids how to do it or wading in the surf or body surfing. And that was it. But he did love history. He did love archaeology. He was a very smart man, and I owe it all to him. And the shipwrecks that you found when you were young, you know, how did that kind of propel your career later on? Well, I guess the the fourth wreck that I found was a Napoleonic era ship. We were living in France, and I found about 50 coins in less than an hour's time on it. And that alone really propelled me because as I showed what I had found to other people and all, then they wanted to work with me. And also, I'd gotten the names uh, at the library. I'd gotten the names of people who had written books or were somehow involved with shipwrecks. And I started writing those people without telling them that I was a kid. 
And so they would answer me back, assuming that I was you know, a grad student or something. And I was asking the questions for that reason. And they helped me out. And I eventually met them. And they were surprised at how young I was. But they continued working with me. I was very lucky to meet those people. So, I mean, you're, you know, you're listening, you've got an audience listenership here who've potentially never, ever explored the ocean the way you have. I mean, how would somebody know that something they've discovered is of value? How would they know what I discovered? So, no, for example, if I was walking and I was doing a bit of, say, underwater exploration myself and I stumble upon something, how does one recognize that it's of, of value, that it's of tre- that's treasure? Well, today, there's actually lots of ways they could do that. They could go online to eBay and look up what they found and see if something like that's being sold. Another way is they could contact somebody like me and send me pictures of it, measurements. And and people do that all the time. And I answer them. I actually try to answer every letter that I get, every email that I get. But I do ask them to tell me something about themselves when they already know who I am. That's amazing. So do you normally get a lot of emails from people? Are there, is, this, is this a booming market that many are not aware of? Or Well, I get emails from people basically every day. I get messages or emails from people where they're wanting me to identify something they found. And I enjoy doing it. And people help me out. And so I'm trying to help others out. And they contact me from Vietnam, Philippines, Morocco, Italy, Greece, you name it. They contact me from all over. Fantastic. If I receive something in another language, I just use Google Translate and I try to answer them back in their own language. That's amazing. So, Lee, you know, when it comes to your early career, you know, because you started so young, what was the present state of underwater archaeology and treasure hunting when you first got into it? I found my first shipwrecks in 1959. The man that most people consider uh, the father of underwater archaeology found dove on his first shipwrecks in 1960. The man he calls the grandfather of underwater archaeology, Peter Throckmorton, he and I found our shipwrecks the same year, 1959. But I don't consider any of us, I don't consider myself or the two men I just mentioned. The first one was actually George Bass. I don't consider us the father of it. I consider uh, Mendel Peterson at the Smithsonian, Ed Link, Bob Marks, who had done stuff several years prior to that in the mid-1950s. They were doing stuff on shipwrecks. They're the real fathers of underwater archaeology. So it had its start already by the time I was doing it. But I was one of the early people to actually get out and find a bunch of shipwrecks. See, I've always found it interesting that, you know, a lot of these discoveries have happened past the 1950s. Were people not really hunting for, you know, all of these discoveries in the early 1900s? You know, what changed that made it just become a thing in the 1950s and 60s? Well, what happened was the diving gear changed. Scuba, as we know it today, came into being during World War II. And after the war, it started being sold commercially to individuals. What happened then is people first were spearfishing, doing that type diving. And then as they were spearfishing, they were accidentally coming across shipwrecks. There were some people that were working shipwrecks all the way back in the 1800s in a way that today I would call it underwater archaeology, but it just wasn't a common thing. But I've read reports and seen the diagrams of what they were doing, what they were finding, the quality of it. By the 1950s, now you had scuba making it very easy to do a lot of these things. And so people started finding that going somewhere intentionally going after wrecks and others were just stumbling on them. And of course, that's how I found my first wrecks. I was just stumbling on them. I had research to try to find where they might be. But the truth is, it was just sort of dumb luck on the first ones I was finding. And the more I got into it and really doing research, the more wrecks I was finding. And there are millions of shipwrecks out there. So it's it's not all that difficult to find them. It's difficult to find the right one 
or to identify something that you've accidentally found. And how many shipwrecks are left to be discovered? I would say less than 1% of the wrecks have been discovered. And as I said earlier, there's literally millions of shipwrecks out there. One estimate was that there were 3 million shipwrecks in the Mediterranean alone. Most of the reports of how many wrecks are out there say that for worldwide. But either way, it's still in the millions. Well, that is a crazy number for sure. But not all of them have gold, right? Or any like... Uh, You're correct. Not all of them have gold. But of the older ones, the ones before 1900, other than fishing vessels, I would say almost every one of them did carry some money. But as far as carrying treasure as a cargo, that was a lot rarer. But the Spanish galleons, which, you know, those are the most famous of the treasure ships, but they certainly weren't the only ones. Uh, The Spanish galleons sailed for about 300 years, you had them sailing, and they lost ships every year. And every year. Some years they lost a dozen or more of them. So there are a lot of treasure wrecks, most of which have not been found. There's plenty out there to be discovered. And now with the equipment that we have, not just the scuba gear, but we now have uh, side scan sonar and magnetometers and all uh, that help us find shipwrecks. The research has got far easier. Now you don't have to go to the National Archives, the Library of Congress to, to read a lot of the old newspapers or rare documents. A lot of that is online today. And so you can do research. Right now, I've been doing research on shipwrecks of the Bahamas. I'm putting it together in book form, not with the idea of publishing it because there's just too much of it. It just keeps it easier for me to track it. But that book right now is longer than Gone with the Wind and War and Peace put together. I think 5,240-something pages right now, and it has over 15,000 footnotes in it. Wow. Uh, Yeah. So I'm obviously real serious about doing the research. It's the longest shipwreck book that I've done. I've done others that were 1,000 pages long, but never something over 5,000, not till now anyway. Lee, can you tell us, I mean, you've got amazing stories and obviously years and wealth of experience. Could you share with all your listeners here one of your most memorable stories, an expedition which you felt has always stood out for you when you look back on your career, the one that you look back at most fondly? One of the first ones that I did, I was in high school and I found a wreck that I'd been researching for about four years and that was the wreck of the Georgiana. And the Georgiana was sunk while running the Union blockade of Charleston, South Carolina. It was trying to run into the harbor and it was caught and wrecked. Anyway, when I found that, well, let me tell you a little bit about the ship itself. Contemporary records described it as more powerful than the Alabama, which was the famous uh, Confederate privateer, you know, cruiser that sank so many Union vessels and all, and I say Union vessels that were mainly merchant vessels, fishing vessels and all, but it sank quite a few of them. There were a number of other privateers. The Georgiana was built for the same purpose, but she was described as being more powerful, in fact, as the most powerful of all of the Confederate cruisers, is the way the contemporary records describe her. But she was sunk on her maiden voyage, and all of her cannon had not yet been mounted on her. And so she sort of passed into history and was more or less forgotten. But she had a million dollar cargo on her when she sank. That was a million dollars in 1863 is what it cost. So multiply that by 100. In today's dollars, it would have cost over 100 million to buy that cargo. I found it when I was in high school and we brought up tons of items from it. If I listed everything that was found and said, okay, we found bullets. We found the ponchos for the soldiers. We found this type of medicine. We found, you know, made a list like that. Barrels of china, cases of buttons. And when I say cases of buttons, there would be probably a million buttons in a case. We found cases of silver-plated brass straight pins. We found cases of cannonballs. Anyway, if I listed it that way, there would be like a thousand different items. But some of those items 
we were finding tens of thousands of the same item. We worked on it for a number of years, but I found it in high school and then worked on it for a few years afterwards. So that was a very special expedition to me because it took me four years of research. Then I found the thing. That sounds amazing. And what's the second one? Yeah, I was just about to ask. <laughs> okay. Well, I had researched the wreck of the Hunley. Uh, the Hunley was the first ship uh, in the history of the entire world. Uh, it was the, f- the first submarine in history to actually sink an enemy vessel. And the reason I say enemy vessel is there have been experiments where submarines that attacked not military vessels, not even any sort of enemy vessel. They were just targets that they were practicing with. But to actually do it and make it work in a war situation, that was the Hunley. And I had researched it, thought I knew where it was, and I searched all one summer with a magnetometer and failed to find it. And point of mine had invited me out on his fishing vessel. He was going to be fishing for blackfish for the first time. It being his first time, it was actually a good thing because we weren't doing it exactly right. At the end of the day, what we were doing, we'd put out a line of traps, but we'd taken all of the lines instead of having them with a buoy on them. They were tied to the stern of the boat and we were anchored. And after they'd been down a while, we started pulling them in and one of them hung up on the bottom. And I told the boat captain, you my friend, his name was Joe Porcelli. I told Joe, don't pull it free. It's just a desert down there. There's just sand. There's nothing to hang up on. We probably have hung up on a shipwreck. And I asked him where we were. And fortunately, and very fortunately, he was a excellent captain and he got his chart out and he puts his finger down. He says, we're about here. And where he put his finger was about where the Housatonic had been sunk. And the Housatonic was the victim of the Hunley. And so I immediately thought we must have found that wreck. And I had not looked for it before because it had been scrapped after the war. And I didn't think there'd be much to find. But I did not want to miss a chance to dive on it. So I asked him if he had any dive gear. And he said that he did, something I didn't mention, he was Korean and short, and I'm six feet tall, at least I used to be, six feet tall, and I couldn't wear his wetsuit, couldn't wear his fins, because I have size 13 feet. Anyway, I ended up going down in my underwear, (laughs) and this was in October, you know, the first part of October, in poor visibility water. It was cold as a brass toilet seat. And, but when I got down to the bottom, instead of what I expected to see, like a ship's boiler or something like that, left from the Housatonic, what I saw looked like a ledge in the sand. And the more I hung on the line, the trap was still hanging there on the bottom, you know, resting on the bottom and the line going to the surface. I'd followed it down. Well, I'm hanging on that and sort of swinging back and forth realized what it was and I went swimming to the surface screaming underwater I found the Hunley I found the Hunley (laughs) and anyway when I did get to the boat uh, they pulled me out of the water the first thing I did was not dry off I went into the cabin and to the wheelhouse where there was a compass a box compass and then I started sighting across that to the channel buoys and to the lighthouses and writing it all down so I could get back to it But that's how I found the wreck. I found the wreck of the Hunley. You know, the first submarine in history to sink an enemy ship. Amazing. Ahoy, investors. Are you on the lookout for a unique opportunity to invest in a thriving industry? Set your sights on ShipShape, the innovative platform connecting boat and yacht owners with top-notch marine service providers. Our team is committed to revolutionizing the marine repair and refit market in North America. But we can't sail these seas alone. With your support, we can enhance our platform and create a significant impact in the industry. Don't let this exciting investment opportunity drift away. Contact us today to learn more about joining our voyage. Reach out to us at info at shipshape.pro. You know, considering we're on the topic of finding things in terms of the classical idea of treasure of gold and coins and 
jewels. What has been the greatest treasure that you found? Well, my favorite treasure isn't gold or silver. I had talked to a couple of my friends when I was in high school. I didn't yet have a car. I talked a couple of them into going with me in one of their cars to an old fort on the Ashley River in South Carolina. And when they saw how muddy the water was, they didn't dive that day. But I went ahead and dove, even though it was zero visibility. And almost immediately after I went in the water, I found uh, first an onion-shaped bottle, which we today call onion bottles, but it was from the late 1600s, early 1700s. And then the next thing I found, the reason it's my favorite piece is that I'd never seen one other than in pictures, but it was a, a wig curler for a man's wig, and they have an odd shape to them. And so even though I couldn't see it, and I even if I had, I'd never seen one in real life, but I knew what it was. So that gave me a thrill beyond any that I've had with gold or silver. But I have found gold and silver. I've found lots of rings. I've found lots of coins. Uh, in fact, a metal detector company had given me a couple of detectors, and the first time that we used them. They give me two detectors. I let my friend use one and I, I used one. The very first day that we used them, we were both finding gold coins with them. I don't remember if we found any silver coins that day, but we did find some really beautiful gold ones. Now, it's not like you run into a treasure chest or are these mm. things just kind of spread out all over the ocean floor? Well, at that site, the coins were spread out. They weren't all together. But sometimes you do find the remains of a chest, but the chests aren't like what you would expect. They're really just shipping crates. Yeah, you know, they're big wooden boxes just nailed together, and typically they would weigh two or 300 pounds. And so it'd take a couple of men to carry them. So tell us, Lee, is there anything unusual that you ever found? What's the oddest, most unusual thing you've ever found as a treasure? Well, we found a friend of mine, Jim Beatty, and I were diving one day, and we found a pewter tankard, and it turned out to be the oldest example of American-made pewter ever found. Wow. You know, intact example. Somebody had found a spoon handle that was older, but it was just the handle of it. But this was a complete tankard. It still had the lid on it and everything. The lid was attached to it. But what was really unique about it, it had a bullet hole in the side of it. And so if you can sort of imagine, you know, a drunken pirate or something and another yeah. another one decides to shoot it out of his hand while he's drinking it. I don't know how that bullet hole got in there, but that's sort of what I think happened. Now, obviously, with the modern day, you know, I've certainly heard stories and I feel like the the tale that's being told right now is a lot of like, mega millionaires who spend money on a submarine in order to find treasure. So I'm wondering, what is the balance between treasure hunting for profit and preserving historical artifacts? How does that fall into this whole thing? Well, if the artifacts are left on the bottom, they will be destroyed. The gold coins, they can be scattered and forever lost, and they can be abraded by the sand and destroyed that way. But the silver coins, electrolysis, will eat them away. If time is allowed to go on without them being recovered, they'll all be destroyed. Most of the shipwrecks happened because the ship ran aground. They didn't have GPS. They didn't have real good maps. So they ran aground on reefs. And by reefs, that could be a sandbar or it can be rocks or it can be you know, a living reef, a coral reef. But that's the main cause of shipwrecks. There are wrecks in deep water, but they're few and far between. In the shallow water, they're often on top of each other. On top of the Georgiana that I mentioned earlier, there's a wreck called the Mary Bowers. So the day that I found the Georgiana, I also found the Mary Bowers. Technically, those weren't the only two that I found that day. We found two others that same day. Both of them had hit the Georgiana but they had gotten off a ways. The Georgiana had run aground, and then these vessels over a period of space of about a year had run on top of it. But one had thought that it hit a sandbar and turned and headed offshore for deeper water, not realizing that 
her hull had torn open, and so she sank offshore of the Georgiana. One of them realized that she was sinking, and she headed inshore to try to beach herself as close to shore as possible. And she's sitting about halfway to shore from the Georgiana. The Georgiana's about a mile offshore. A lot of the wrecks that we find, we'll find them clustered around a reef. I found 28 wrecks in one day one time, just oh going along the cliff face of where I realized, hey, ships would have wrecked here. And then I searched that area and found 28 wrecks in one day. 28 wrecks in one day. Absolutely. My goodness. Lee, tell us, I mean, your expeditions, you mentioned before, they're obviously risky, given the fact that, you know, you're doing things like jumping in the water, deep sea, sometimes without even diving gear. Tell us about the kind of risks that are associated with this kind of work and also one of the most risky expeditions that you've ever been on. There was a wreck in the Great Lakes that we were working. We're working it under a state permit. You have to follow the laws. You do not want to get out there and loot a shipwreck. When I found wrecks originally, I didn't know what the laws were. And so there were wrecks that I brought stuff up off without permits and all. But that was a long time ago. And uh, to work the wreck of the Georgiana, the Mary Bowers, and uh, the Constance, and the other wrecks that I was finding in high school and right out of high school, I ended up getting a law passed just so that we could get permission to work the wrecks. Considering we're kind of on this topic, how does one really balance the historical significance, right? Most of these shipwrecks have human tragedy. How do you balance that with the thrill of the search. Okay, you just mentioned human tragedy. I'm not sure if I would call it that. It certainly was a financial one to people, but most of these wrecks, the ship ran aground and everybody got off alive. They may have died on their way to shore, which was common, but when a ship runs aground, normally everybody comes up on the deck And then they launch the lifeboats and they go on or they wait on the wreck until somebody comes and picks them up because it's sticking out of the water. There's as much out of the water as normally would be out of the water. So there's not normally a reason for them to die on probably 80 or 90 percent of the wrecks. I have never in all of the hundreds of wrecks that I've been on, I've never found human remains on a shipwreck. And so uh, this thing of wrecks or underwater grave sites is just not something I agree with. It's just not what they, what most of them are. There are exceptions to that. Yeah, I guess I never considered that while a ship is sinking, everyone pretty much gets on deck. Therefore, you just don't run into any human mer- mer- remains. So in the moments of solitude underwater, surrounded by the remnants of history and you know, kind of the silence of it. What emotions do you find yourself grappling with? Elation more than anything else, because when we discover something, it's exciting. That would be the most common. I'm sort of like I described my father. I don't really have any fear. I don't have fear of death and all. It's not that I want to die. I'm not one of these thrill seekers that jumps out of planes just for the thrill of it. I don't go hand feed sharks. And that's a very popular thing among divers. I wouldn't even consider it. I think it's foolish. People have lost their hands who were tourists feeding sharks. Mm. Uh, One time, a surgeon who was diving and hand feeding sharks, as smart as he was, he lost his hand. Divers have been eaten by sharks, tourist divers, who went out there to, to watch the sharks. I see them underwater, and I'm not I'm not afraid of them but I don't draw them into me with bloody fish. Hmm. So what would you say the present state of kind of this underwater archaeology and treasure hunting is? Is it headed in a good direction? You know, what's your personal opinion on all that? They need to work together more. A lot of the under underwater archaeologists that I've known, they're good people, but they may only know one aspect of the shipwrecks. They may only know sp- you know, Spanish shipwrecks, or they may only know Civil War wrecks, or only iron versus wood, or only a certain time period. They do so much study on one specific thing that they're working 
where a lot of the people who are engaged in treasure hunting, they've worked all kinds of different wrecks. Like I've worked on them, uh, on wrecks from the 1500s, wrecks from World War II, and really almost everything in between. But some of the treasure hunters have done the same thing I have done and worked on all these different types. And they have done an extreme amount of research. They've become extremely professional. And a few of them, I think, are among, they really should be uh, referring to themselves as for-profit underwater archaeologists or capitalistic underwater archaeologists because they are doing underwater archaeology. The underwater archaeology, if you're doing it properly, helps you find more of the stuff on the ship. It helps you understand what's going on. It makes the artifacts that you find more valuable. So I think they're actually doing a good thing because they're saving artifacts, and the ones that are really good at it are doing it properly. I think there should be an underwater archaeologist on every treasure hunting project. That's not the case, but it should be. But it is the case on a lot of them. The problem, though, is that if you work with treasure hunters, you're violating the oath that you take to join some of these archaeological organizations, and then you're blackballed. I used to give a lot of talks at archaeology conferences, you know, when I was first starting out, and I no longer do it because I don't, just don't want to have to go and fight with them where they mm -hmm. don't seem to understand that they should be working with the treasure hunters, not not against them. Yeah, I do work with them. I have been a government underwater archaeologist, and I have been an out-and-out -out treasure hunter. So can I ask, how was your uncovering fragments of the past influence your understanding of humanity? our collective journey and our place in the world? It's a real good question. At one point, what I was researching was actually uh, the effect of shipwrecks on religion in the state of South Carolina. And that seems like an odd, an odd topic, but I, I realized that it was two brothers and they were in a shipwreck in St. Helena Sound. And I say they were in a shipwreck they survived, and in one of them's diary, he talks about about the storm that came up, and he was showing fear. And then one of the sailors said that nothing was going to happen to him; they're going to be fine. And just at that moment, the masts fell. And then in another case, a religious group that their expedition they tried to settle uh, Derry in Panama. They were from Scotland, and they were Presbyterians. And they, they had tried to settle down there. The climate was too bad, the mosquitoes, and it was killing everybody off. And so they were returning home. And they had stopped off South Carolina to get supplies and all on their way back home. And several of them came ashore just to attend services. And then a hurricane happened to hit at that time, and the ships were sunk, and everybody who was on those ships died. You know, the ships were broken apart, being pounded on the shoals and all. And so Archibald Stobo, who was a preacher that had come ashore, he founded the Presbyterian Church, at least the Charleston, the South Carolina version of it. He was the founder of that. And then in another shipwreck, the person that England had sent over to be the head of the Church of England in Carolina, his shipwrecked. And he ended up on Morris Island. He survived it, ended up on Morris Island where no people lived. And then there was miles of marsh to get through to get to the where there were people. It was just a very terrible experience. And then when he got to Charleston and he started meeting the people and dealing with them a number of years later, basically the people of Charleston were all pirates and scoundrels and worthless. <laughs> and, uh, it was... a the worst place he had ever been to in his life was his opinion of it. So I, I doubt that his effect on the church there was very positive because he had that attitude of the people, about the people. And then he ended up dying in another shipwreck again on Morris Island. And there were other accounts, but at one point I had all the details together of these different clerics and all of different religions. and how they had faced death and how they had dealt with it and what how they dealt with the people afterwards. 
you know, did they spread a word of joy or did they spread a word of doom and disaster? That is absolutely fascinating yeah. to hear kind of the early beginnings of a lot of these like cultural movements within society as a result of shipwrecks. Yeah, so it, it does affect them. And one of the wrecks I found was called the Stonewall Jackson. And the Stonewall Jackson was a Civil War blockade runner, you know, an American Civil War blockade runner, because other countries have had their own civil wars. But that vessel had 40,000 army shoes on it that were destined for Lee's, General Lee's army. Well, those shoes never arrived because of that shipwreck. His army needed those shoes desperately. And one of the reasons that Lee took his army to Gettysburg, supposedly he heard that there were shoes in a warehouse in Gettysburg. And of course, Gettysburg was the disaster that really ended it for the South, even though the war didn't end for almost another year. That was the last hope the Confederate Army could not recover after that disaster. It was just so bad. And so I look at that shipwreck of the Stonewall Jackson, and I realize the difference it could have made if it had, you know, for the south side, if it had gotten to shore safely. Uh, so shipwrecks have have big impact. The Georgiana that I was talking about earlier, if it had gotten into Charleston Harbor and had all of her guns mounted and then gone out and started doing what the Alabama had been doing, that could have changed the course of the war. So all these things matter. It's not just the deaths yeah. that happen on a ship and on the Stonewall Jackson, nobody died, mm. but it still changed, the, in a way, changed part of the war. Let me ask you, you know, obviously when we talk about treasure, there's a lot of fictional ideas of treasure, right? Like, like pirates buried treasure. Is that true? You know, have you ever heard of that? Well, pirates definitely buried treasure, just like thousands of people in the South during the Civil War buried their money so that it couldn't be stolen from them during the war. A lot of that still is buried. So yes, pirates were among the many people that buried treasure, but their intent was to come back and get it. Whether or not they did, who knows? I don't look for buried treasure because People did not want buried treasure found, and so there's very little records to be had that mm. gives you even a clue of where it might be. There is one case where I have looked for it, and that's some of the Confederate gold. George Trenum, who happened to be the same person that owned the cargo on the Georgiana, George Trenum left some clues to where he left money. And I think they had already been followed through with. I don't really think it's there. It's a possibility it's still there. But he gave a written description of where the stuff was. And um, how many shipwrecks have you found? And what do you think the total value of the artifacts that you found is? I mean, it's a well, whole career. First of all, although I found literally hundreds of wrecks, I've worked relatively few of those. Even some that I think are very valuable, some of those I've only been on for an hour or two, and that's all. And there are a number of reasons for that. The first being, I never did it really for the money. The money that I made was just sort of a, a bonus. I was interested in the history and the archaeology, and that's why I was doing it. And making money out of it was secondary. But other wrecks... I haven't worked because I couldn't get the legal rights to work them, you know, couldn't get a permit to do it, or I couldn't get funding to work it. But of what's been brought up by my team easily is over $100 million is what it would sell for today of the stuff that I've brought up. Stuff that other people have brought up because of my research and all, that would add another easily a half billion dollars to it of you know, wrecks that have been worked based on my research. You know, that's some shocking numbers. So do you have a favorite fictional treasure from books or films? And how does that compare to real life treasures that you've encountered? Well, Robinson Crusoe was one of the first books I read. And he got on the ship that he wrecked. He went out to it and he pulled up rum and guns and different things and enabled him to survive on the island. 
And to me, that was real treasure. And so my dream as a child was diving on a shipwreck, bringing up rum and stuff and eating off the dinner plates and all. And I haven't found any rum on a shipwreck, but I found lots of scotch, lots of wine, lots of champagne, Verve Clicquot <laughs> champagne, GH Mum champagne. And yes, I've drunk my share of it. And I've eaten off the dinner plates, drunk out of the beer mugs and stuff off the wreck. So I've sort of lived that childhood dream, really enjoyed it. As far as the most realistic treasure movie, I'm bad at remembering names of movies, but there have been a couple that I thought were very real to life. Do you remember the movie The Deep? Yeah. I do. Okay, well, in The Deep, you actually have two wrecks. You have a modern wreck on top of a wreck. And the other wreck was called, uh, in the storyline, uh, was called the Griffin. And it supposedly was a French ship that uh, had been sailing with the Spanish fleet and was wrecked in 1715. Well, I worked the 1715 fleet when I was back in the 1960s. I worked that fleet. And there really was a French ship by that name that traveled with that fleet. And nobody knows exactly what happened to it. Some say that it arrived in France and others say that it was lost. But they pulled that out of a true story to add to the effect of their movie. And in the modern wreck, they were finding morphine and stuff. Well, on the Georgiana, and remember the Georgiana on top of it is another shipwreck. But on the Georgiana, some of what we were finding was morphine. And, oh, wow. Yeah. And on the Spanish wreck in the movie The Deep, they found a ruby studded cross and they were calling it a bishop's cross. Well, the bishop's crosses had emeralds on them, not rubies. And a friend of mine, Teddy Tucker, who's now deceased, but Teddy was working a shipwreck in Bermuda. That's where he lived. And Teddy found an emerald studded bishop's cross. And so that's where that part of the movie came from. So they actually took a lot of things out of real real life and put them into the movie. And some of the stuff they did, I had been part of, you know, that they used in the movie. I wasn't in the movie. They didn't mention me in the movie or whatever. But I and a lot of other people had worked on the real things. So as we come to our conclusion here, one of the questions I have is, what is some words of wisdom that you've used your entire life? You know, like what has been a moral that you've lived by? Uh, pretty much, I believe that anybody can discover a shipwreck. I'm actually in the autism spectrum and I'm dyslexic. I have some memory problems I've had all my life. And if I, as a 12 year old, could go out and discover shipwrecks, I think anybody can. Mm. And I believe the main difference between somebody that succeeds at it and doesn't succeed at it is the effort they put into it. A friend of mine, Mel Fisher, put years of his life into finding the Atosha. He could have given up at any point. He did not give up and he found it. I have great faith in people's ability to accomplish things if they work hard. Can I ask what- on a very light note, um, Lee? You know how everybody has certain quirks or certain things that they do. A lot of things, as you said, you know, a lot of the finds have been a stroke of luck in the beginning or a couple of situations where, for example, you came across 28 wrecks in a day. Do you have any sort of ritual that you do before you actually go on an expedition? Any particular sort of little lucky charm that you carry with you so that that aids you or you believe in when you're going uh, searching? No, not really. Uh, No? Uh, that's just not not me. But uh, at one point before an expedition, I sat down and wrote a prayer, a shipwreck salver's prayer. And uh, it was asking God to help us, to guide us. Because if you've been there when all of this stuff happened, and to protect us from all of the harm that could come to us. And I've read that before a number of expeditions. That's amazing. And uh, kind of a final question here for any aspiring marine archaeologist, what would you give as advice? Part of me wants to say don't do it. <laughs> uh, and that's because it's, it's one of the hardest things that I can imagine for people to do 
it takes so much knowledge to do it as underology where it really counts. It's not hard to find shipwrecks, but to do it as a living is a totally different thing. And you have the problems between the state governments with the treasure hunters or with the universities with the treasure hunters, and that needs to be sorted out. If they could solve that, I would highly recommend it because that's the biggest hurdle. But if they're going to do it, they need to go out and study a hundred different things to do it right. Well, Lee, where can people find you and read more about your discoveries? Well, I'm getting ready to start a YouTube channel. Technically, it exists, but there's next to nothing on it. But it is Shipwrecks. It's at Shipwrecks Guru. You know, the symbol at and then Shipwrecks Guru on YouTube. But pretty soon, I'll be posting a lot of stuff on it. I am on Facebook. Those are two places I could look for me. Well, Lee, it was great talking to you and hearing all of these stories of treasure and adventure. It's an absolute, absolute pleasure. Honestly, it was so interesting. I mean, I could almost feel, you know, when you were describing some of the situations, you almost feel you're there walking through it with you. Well, I hope you felt that way. But thank you. That's very nice for you to say. I've enjoyed talking with you all. It's been an absolute pleasure. You both had real good questions. Thank you. Awesome. Check back every Tuesday for our latest episode. And be sure to like, share and subscribe to ShipShape.pro.